Uh, so thank you all for virtually attending the Meet the Artist public meeting for the Bryn Mawr Hollywood Station. Uh, my name is Brian Weslowski. I am part of the community outreach team for the Red Purple Modernization Phase 1 project, and I will be the moderator this evening. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to run through a few items first. Uh, as you can see, we have live ASL interpretation this evening. We will also be recording this meeting to share on the project's website so you can refer back to it and share with others. We also will also have a presentation, including an introduction of the artists and then a Q&A in which we will be taking questions and comments live regarding the public art for the new stations. If you have a question or comment during the presentation or Q&A, please write it in the chat box. We will be recording all questions and comments for review and consideration as it relates to the public art for the stations. Please note that we will only be focusing on public art this evening. If you have, question, if you have questions related to construction, please email us at rpm at transitchicago.com. Uh, but with that, I would like to hand, hand it over to Tammy Chase to kick off the meeting. Hello, everyone. My name is Tammy Chase. I um, am also part of the Red and Purple Modernization Outreach Team. Um, I'm having a little bit of video trouble at the moment, but hopefully I'll see you all very soon. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Um, so we're really excited you guys are here tonight. Um, we're going to go over um, the following topics. We'll talk a little bit about what Red and Purple Modernization is, uh, including a, just a short summary of the project and where we're at. Uh, we'll also provide you an, uh, an overview of the CTA art program, um, followed by an explanation of the process that we use to uh, select the artists for the RPM stations. You'll get to meet the artists tonight, um, so we're very excited to have that happen for you. And then you'll have a chance to ask some questions and learn more about the process. Next slide, please. Um, so the Red and Purple Modernization Program or RPM for short, you'll hear us say RPM quite a bit tonight, um, is going to rebuild all of the red and purple lines between Belmont on the south and Linden on the north. This is a 10 mile corridor, dozen, you know, more than a dozen stations. And that is why we are doing this project in phases. Currently we're building phase one. Uh, this project will add capacity to our rail system as well as replace century old structures. Phase one includes the three uh, main components that you see in front of you. That includes Lawrence to Bryn Mawr, which is going to rebuild the Lawrence, Argyle, Berwyn, and Bryn Mawr stations into fully accessible modern facilities. Um, it's also rebuilding about a mile, uh, a little over a mile of track structure. In fact, these are the stations for which we've hired the artists that you'll hear. Um, these stations, like I said, will be fully accessible with elevators and escalators and open in 2025. The second major piece of this pro project is building a rail bypass um, near, north of Belmont. That did open in 2021, and it's helped us reconfigure our red, purple, and brown line train traffic in that area. Um, and now we are rebuilding the red, 100-year-old red and purple line structures um, between Belmont and Addison um, as the next uh, step in that particular piece of the work. Uh, the third component of the project is replacing a more than 50-year-old signal system that um, helps our trains navigate and, and, uh, and, and operate across our system. Um, we, as Brian mentioned, we will focus just on art tonight, but I do want to mention that we will have construction meetings in, on June 21st and 22nd. Um, if you have not received information about how to register for those, feel free to drop us a, chat, a message in the chat or email us at rpm at transitchicago.com. We'll get you that information. So next slide. So uh, just a quick look at the stations that we're talking about tonight. Um, there will be new artwork for each. Uh, you'll see Lawrence and Argyle here. Next slide. As well as uh, here's Berwyn, the main station house, as well as Bryn, uh, Bryn Mawr's main station house. There will be art for both Bryn Mawr's main station house and the Hollywood station house uh, entrance as well. And with that, I will turn this over to my colleague, Allison Colonies to talk about CTA's art program. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. My name is Allison Coglanese, and I'm project coordinator with the Art and Transits program. 
About the CTA public art, the truck, the Chicago Transit Authority incorporate, incorporates quality design and construction <clears throat> projects and from time to time commissions and installs public art for CTA riders and the communities it serves. The CTA commissions professional artists to create original site-specific artwork for permanent display in new and newly renovated transit facilities. Original artworks contribute to each station's identity and enhance travel for CTA customers, as well as regional, national, and international visitors. Next slide. The new commissioned artworks enter the art collection of the Chicago Transit Authority. The CTA is home to an impressive collection of art, including mosaics, image transfer artworks, and sculptures. More than 100 artworks are exhibited at 65 CTA stations and are seen daily by CTA customers. The original artworks contribute to each location's identity and enhance travel for customers. Art in CTA facilities promotes a friendly, inviting atmosphere for these locations, which function as gateways to the communities they serve. For more information about CTA and CTA's public art collection, please visit transitchicago.com slash art. Five art locations are considered for this project. Stations include Bryn Mawr, Bryn Mawr Hollywood, the station auxiliary entrance, Berwyn, Argyle, and Lawrence. The CTA seeks to commission per permanent contemporary artworks that are of superior artistic merit, relate to the station location and environment, provide an improved and more attractive transit experience, are original in concept and execution and fabricated of safe, highly permanent materials and processes and require minimal maintenance. I will now turn over to my colleague, Elizabeth Kelly. The Call for Artists. On February 23rd, 2022, CTA advertised a call for artists for the RPM project for Lawrence, Argyle, Berwyn, and Bryn Mawr stations. The Call for Artists was open to all living artists, both emerging and established, with a background in two-dimensional and three-dimensional media, and an interest in public art. Prior public art experience was not a requirement, CTA received 166 responses. Next slide. The artist selection process. In reviewing and evaluating the responses to this call for artists, CTA considered the following factors, which are listed in order of importance, beginning with the most important. Artistic merit as evidenced in submitted digital images. A written statement of interest. Professional recognition as evidenced by awards, honors, and exhibition records. Qualifications as evidenced by resume. A review committee reviewed the responses to the call for artists for completeness and minimal and minimum qualification and eliminated non-viable responses. A review committee evaluated the remaining responses, determined a relative ranking of candidates based on an all-inclusive evaluation and compiled a short list of candidates for the project. From the short list of candidates, a selection committee identified finalists for the station locations. Finalists were invited to negotiations and subsequently entered into a contract with CTA for the artwork commission. The selected artist responsibilities. The artists awarded a contract will be responsible to collaborate with CTA and RPM to design, fabricate, and deliver an original work of art of durable materials that requires minimal maintenance. Among other requirements of the contract, the artist will be required to meet the project timeline and budget. The commissions. The five art commissions are for the design, fabrication, and delivery of art. The budget for each commission is $150,000.
This is inclusive of design, engineering if applicable, materials, fabrication, delivery of artwork, and an artist fee of approximately 15 to 20% of the project budget. The timeline for the art for these projects. Um, today, June 6th and tomorrow, June 7th, we are hosting four Meet the Artists community meetings to meet all five artists. Um, beginning in summer 2023 and continuing through spring 2024, the artists will develop their artwork concepts and designs. In spring 2024 to 2025, there, um, we will have the approval of artwork, the fabrication and delivery of artwork will occur in collaboration with CTA. And in 2025, the art will be installed and station openings. Again, to remind you, the RPM artists are William Conger of the Bryn Mawr Station, Alice Hargrave for the Bryn Mawr Hollywood Station, David Lozano for Berwyn Station, Mayumi Lake for Argyle Station, and Tom Tolumki for the Lawrence Station. And now it is my privilege to introduce artist William Conger uh, for the Bryn Mawr Station. And uh, Mr. Conger will talk about his work um, and show you some images. Okay, you don't have to touch a thing. You can speak in. Oh, thank you. I'm very pleased and uh, honored to, to be here tonight and to be among the five artists chosen to do work at the various uh, new stations. I want to give you a brief overview of my career and, and in doing that I'll be showing several images of past work, uh, most of it public in nature, and I'll try to explain a little bit of uh, what my what my work is about and and uh, what I wanted to to do. Uh, first, I I grew up in in Chicago. I have a long history in the city. Uh, I uh, have lived uh, almost all of my life uh, in Chicago. I went to Chicago schools and and then I went to the School of the Art Institute. Uh, then I spent some years in the American Southwest in in uh, Albuquerque, continuing my education. Uh, then later I came back to Chicago and attended the University of Chicago. And uh, I was married and I began to raise a family with my wife. And then I had a teaching career at both uh, DePaul University and later at, at Northwestern University. And uh, <clears throat> during that time, I also uh, pursued my career. I've had uh, 48 uh, one-person shows over, these, over this time and uh, another one coming up next year. I've shown mostly in uh, Chicago and the Midwest, but also in, in LA and New York and, and a few other places around the country. Uh, in 2010, I had a large retrospective of my work covering 50 years of my career at the Chicago Cultural Center. Uh, the painting I'm showing right now is called Broadway. I did it in 1985. It's in the collection of the Art Institute of Chicago. And what I set out to do with this painting was to somehow recapture the excitement and energy that I experienced as a kid growing up in East uh, Lakeview and East uh, Lincoln Park, uh, where Broadway was the first big street west of the lake. And it was such a tremendous uh, uh, contrast uh, from the serenity and quiet of the lake and the horizon. Uh, here was a street that was just cluttered with noise and objects and in those days streetcars and dozens of little shops uh, up and down the street, all of which I love far more, frankly, than, than school itself. I love going to and from school along Broadway 
Uh, and that really stayed with me and uh, over my career has still has remained uh, really an inspiration. And so, uh, next slide. Uh, this is one we just talked about, so we'll have the next slide. This painting is uh, called Intersections. It's part of uh, uh, three uh, separate components uh, that I created for a Chicago police station about 20 years ago. And in this work, I tried to uh, indicate some sense of the uh, harmony that is, that is sought ideally for diverse groups and neighborhoods and peoples uh, in that area. Uh, it was the, the 18th district uh, uh, Chicago police station. And this is a large painting and its companion is also large. And then there were also uh, some uh, art class windows associated with the, with the whole project. I should point out, of course, that all of my work is abstract, uh, but I think it does allude quite easily to uh, both private and public memories and experiences of being in a dynamic urban environment particularly Chicago, uh, with its uh, busyness and uh, strong history, as well as its organization and structure that we see symbolized by its architecture. And then finally, the overriding awareness of nature, the sky, the lake, the prairie. I think uh, these three components really are, are what my work uh, is about. Uh, Next slide, please. This painting I called uh, Kabuki as a way to reference uh, the Japanese uh, ritual play and uh, uh, highly stylized performances in the Kabuki plays. The, uh, I think it, it also alludes to the very nature of being a human being in a, in a very busy urban environment, the idea of excitable, dance and movement. Uh, I think this is part of the human element, you might say, uh, in my work. There are these somewhat figural associations that come to mind, I think, when, uh, when one looks at this otherwise very abstract work. Uh, I try to organize uh, the elements in such a way that they're, they're in contrast, sometimes contradictory, sometimes paradoxical. Uh, but in the end, there is a kind of unifying structure that holds them uh, uh, for our observation and, and thought. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a painting I titled Sheridan, an obvious reference to the famous street by that name, and uh, another street that exists, you might say, at the borderline between the our inland sea, Lake Michigan, and the, the city itself. And then in addition, the, the vastness of the uh, prairie and the prairie sky. Uh, I sometimes think that even the skyscrapers were built as a, a way to honor and, and uh, uh, you know, symbolize that, that nice relationship between the city and its natural environment. So in this work, there's a lot of open air, as it were. There's a, a quick illusion, an easy illusion, I think, to our lake and to the uh, structural uh, elements that, that are also part of a, of a big city. I'll have the next slide, please. This is a painting I did for a large mural that I was commissioned to make uh, for a location on Clark Street uh, near Belmont. And it's an outside mural, although it's not easily seen from the street, it exists on an atrium wall uh, separating two uh, buildings. And uh, the painting uh, commemorates, of course, the Green Bay Trail, which ran right down Clark Street and uh, was an ancient trail, not only for 
uh, prehistoric uh, animals and so forth, uh, but also for later indigenous peoples, and then finally the pioneers and the settlers who uh, used that uh, route to bring in goods, uh, deliver goods, and basically uh, deal with the whole uh, environment around Chicago. And Chicago is known, of course, as a city that has brought in the produce and the the resources of the whole central part of the United States has transformed them and then has exported them out to the rest of the world. And it's this that really made Chicago a major city. And so here I try to show in a way the networking of uh, roadways and pathways as it were, uh, together with the colors and a kind of shape uh, organization that may call to mind some of our Native American past and its importance, uh, uh, remaining importance in the identity uh, of our city. Say the next slide, please. Here is, you can see on the uh, side, a, a photograph of the mural being painted uh, on the side of the building. It's a large piece. It's uh, uh, some 45 feet high and 68 feet long, and uh, it's mo mostly seen from windows of the adjacent building. And so that accounts in a way for the uh, many divisions of shapes uh, because observers from various windows can't really see the whole thing together. Uh, they can see parts and then uh, more or less uh, uh, fashion the rest of the painting uh, by looking uh, you know, this way and that. And so uh, this is an exciting painting for me because I felt it captures uh, something of this uh, three-part interest of mine, the dynamics of human energy, the structure and, and uh, strength of uh, industrial and, and uh, service purposes of the city, and finally the sense of vista, the awareness of Chicago as a great city in the prairie facing the lake. And I think that awareness of nature in particular is something that helps to give everyone in the city uh, uh, a continual sense of identity. It's something big to, to always relate to. You can always, I think everybody in Chicago is somehow, no matter where they are in the city, they're always aware that there's a big lake <laughs> near them and that there's a big sky above them and that there's a big prairie around them. And this is a kind of stabilizing and optimistic, I think, uh, notion. Oh, the next slide, please. This is a large commission I created for the uh, Chicago Cultural Center about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I simply called it Chicago. I wanted it to commemorate the the history of our city's industry and, and commercialization, the, the product of manufacturing, the uh, sense of movement, and yet order. Uh, I think when one looks at this, although it's, it's very abstract, I, I think almost everyone can get a sense that, well, there's something almost uh, like the railroads here. There's something about railroad signals. There's the sense of the sky, the lake, the the movement, the tracks, the roads, uh, all of this is something that's part of our collective identity uh, as urban dwellers. And at the same time, it uh, celebrates uh, Chicago's uh, rich and uh, amazing uh, history. I should point out that uh, all the city is quite young as big cities go in America. Uh, <clears throat> I've lived long enough to say that I have uh, lived through about 40% of our city's history, <laughs> which is uh, something that is curious, but at the same time, it indicates my own uh, great fascination uh, for the constant change and, and growth and rebirth uh, of Chicago. 
on on one side you can see an installation view of the of the painting uh, uh, interestingly it was done in four parts and i never saw the four parts together until it was mounted at the cultural center uh, it's about 14 13 to 14 feet high which is a little bit taller than my studio space and so i did it in four parts but that in a way also symbolizes the unity uh, of our city, maybe the north, the south, and the north, the northwest, and the southwest components or sections of the of our city. Can I have the next slide, please. Oh, there it is the uh, the interior view of the installation again uh, at McCormick Place. As you can see, there's a stage in front of it. And whenever there is something of note to be talked about at the at the cultural center, uh, uh, I'm happy that my painting is backing it up and is there as a symbol again of uh, the the effusive uh, interest and in, and dynamic of of urban life. Next slide, please. Well, finally, I have a small painting. <laughs> this is only about 24 inches high, uh, but I call it Sunrise. And again, uh, despite its tiny size, it still, for me, uh, is a kind of portrait of Chicago as one looks eastward to imagine or see the, the sunrise. At the same time, there's a kind of implicit uh, suggestion of the city rising again as if. Uh, as it did uh, after the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. And so this, uh, I think, is, is an optimistic sense of uh, something that can, can celebrate the continual rebirth of, uh, of our experiences in the city and of the city itself. And I want people to feel that their own associations that they have when they look at my work uh, although private are at the same time also public. And the public associations uh, uh, can relate and elicit our private associations as well. And it's that dialogue that I think uh, my art is attempting to, to promote and to, and to inspire. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Hello, this is Elizabeth Karpowitz again, and now I would like to introduce um, Alice Hargrave, our artist for Bryn Mawr Hollywood, and also say thank you to William Conger. Alice. Let's see, there I am. Hello everyone, I'm Alice Hargrave. I'm a photo-based artist. I am also deeply rooted and born and raised in Chicago. So I'm thus very thrilled to be a part of this project. I received my MFA from the University of Illinois in Chicago, and I'm included in several permanent collections, such as the Museum of Contemporary Photography, the Art Institute of Chicago, Artist Book Collection, the Ruttenberg Collection, Willis Tower. I have exhibited internationally, and I received the 2020 Illinois Arts Council Individual Artist Grant. And I've received many, uh, several residencies across the country that have helped make this work possible. I was a photography professor at Columbia College for over 20 years, and I'm uh, currently engaging my practice within a context of environmental activism and conservation. I incorporate sound, video, and photographic imagery within layered site-specific installations, often addressing impermanence such as environmental insecurity, habitat loss, and species extinctions. I've always, throughout my career, been interested in creating visual dialogues bridging art and science. The work allows me to develop closer connections to the natural world, and through research, I attempt to better understand the immensity and complexities and mysteries of the natural world so I can better channel these things into the conceptual underpinnings of the work. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a proposal for the Museum of Contemporary Art in Cleveland, Ohio 
to help prevent bird collisions by placing the chaconia chaconia or white stork pattern onto the glass. Large scale facades of glass like this one and like most glass buildings pose a severe threat to migratory birds. So what I do is I photograph the sound waves of the actual bird calls, and in this case, the white stork, and I use the colors of the birds themselves. So the hot pink color comes from the color of the stork's skin. And then I stitch together the patterns into larger patterns that then in turn can be printed on several diverse substrates. Uh, for bird collision prevention, like in this case, usually vinyl or directly on the glass. So by placing the patterns on the glass, birds can then actually perceive the glass. And personally, I just love the poetry of the calls of the birds themselves, visually and literally shouting out to other birds, do not fly here. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the actual pattern itself. It can be produced at any scale or any size ratio, and again, on many substrates. So besides the glass or vinyl, it could be printed on metal, fabric, paper, wallpaper. And it was even made into a line of silk uh, clothing by Dovima Paris, a haute couturier fashionista who found the pattern online and wanted to do a line of clothing with the pattern, which I agreed to as long as the proceeds went back to the birds and I got a dress. So my modus operandi right now is to put the work to work. Next slide, please. So this is an installation of wallpaper that is the vocalizations of the Rosiat Spoonbill from 2021. So using the actual colors again of the birds, color becomes advocacy. Loud, bright colors shout out for these and all birds in peril. And hung on top of the wallpaper are landscapes from the Everglades where the spoonbills used to thrive. Climate change has caused them to move further north and away from Southern Florida uh, because their historic nesting grounds are becoming submerged by rising sea levels, sadly. So. That's the juxtaposition of the voices with the landscapes where they used to be found, or they are still found, but in less, more rare. Next slide, please. This is a detail of the vocalizations. And I wanted to show this because I just love the way the patterns look almost like calligraphy. Bird vocalizations are a whole other language to decipher, and they remind me of hieroglyphics. So I kind of see this as a kind of Rosetta Stone for the languages of different species. Uh, the spoonbill's uh, plumage is this gorgeous, gorgeous hot magenta pink. Again, using the surprising colors of the birds, I wanted to debunk this ubiquitous argument that I kept hearing, which was, why save that simple brown bird? Well, that simple brown bird might have hot pink feet or bright yellow eyes like the snowy owls that I've seen on Chicago's lakefront and we'll see a little later in the presentation. Next slide, please. This next slide, there's the snowy owl, as a matter of fact. So this is Avian Havens. It was a finalist for Earth Art Chicago in 2022. The shape is a wingspan, a haven, and a respite from the wind. And when you're inside, you're a wash in color, pattern, and speckled light. The structure consists of 18, 10 feet by three feet interlocking glass panels in a V formation, which is a nod to both the migrating birds that travel in a V formation, as well as the wingspan of birds. Uh, nine species uh, are included with their unique patterns and their unique colors. They're all migrating birds that migrate through Chicago. Uh, we sit right on the Mississippi Flyway, which is one of the largest flyways in the United States. And that's why Chicago has been designated the most dangerous city for birds. Wonderful. Um, so we have to work to get that bird collision prevention uh, laws in the books. Um, I've collaborated with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology for much of the bird work. And I've worked with tools of science from the burgeoning field of acoustic ecology. So using sound for conservation has become an important part of the work. 
Next slide, please. This is the Conference of the Lakes after Farid Attar from 2021. It's another collaborative project with global scientists, in this case, limnologists, uh, scientists who study freshwater lakes. It's an installation of 20 10 foot by 5 foot semi transparent fabric panels installed in a cascading semicircular formation that came down from one corner of the space and curved around. Each panel represents a particular global freshwater lake. And the imagery used on the panels can be archives, vintage photography, actual colors of the lakes, such as pink lakes from Australia, or magenti algae lakes from Lake Toval, for example, in Italy. And they contain scientific data. And the data shows how each particular lake is changing due to climate change. Lakes from all seven continents are represented as well as the myriad of ways that water is changing due to climate shifts. The exhibition is titled The Canary in the Lake, which alludes to the canary in the coal mine because freshwater lakes function as sentinels of climate change. Next slide, please. This is Curiouser and Curiouser, a hanging cabinet of curiosities from 2021. It's one of three finalists for the new Illini Hall building at the University of Illinois in Champaign. The patterns hanging in space represent mathematics, data science, and statistics. And they often include patterns that reflect biomimicry or germination patterns like phylotaxis or the Fibonacci spiral. And the Barnsley fern is the shape of the installation itself, which you can see from the bird's eye view. To create um, that same sort of transparency that we saw in the previous lake work, I can print on perforated metal. And that gives a kind of sheer lightness and fluidity to the imagery. And that helps to keep each of the panels in dialogue with each other with that transparency. Next uh, image, please. This is a detail of Green Day's migration calls from 2018. And I'm showing this detail to underline how the kind of layering can create this dialogue or figure ground relationship between the figures, the birds, and the landscape, which is something I might wanna explore with the Red Line Project. And uh, in this image, there are several different types of vocalizations and colors sampled from the Nene bird, which is one of the five most threatened birds of North America. And they're layered in front of a landscape where they used to thrive. Next image, please. This piece is Sightings, Spring Migration Along the Mississippi Flyway from 2019. I made a large totem-like installation of many of the species that I had witnessed that particular spring migration season in Chicago. And each piece is a singular phrase or a call. They're eight inches by 24 inches printed on aluminum. And these are six of them. So you can really see how unique each of the vocalizations are. And again, the colors are the most surprising colors that I find in the birds or the colors that you don't notice usually in the birds, smaller areas of a bird that has this amazing color. Next slide, please. This is titled Along the Riparian Way 2021. It was one of three finalists for the Budlong Library, a public art facade and reading garden. It consists of eight 15 foot by four foot photographic prints on perforated metal that visually extend the colonnade out in either direction. The panels function as a sort of bridge between the inside source of knowledge that a public library represents and the outdoor sources of knowledge and wisdom that the Budlong Woods and nearby uh, natural areas represent along the river, which is why we're calling it the riparian zone. Uh, the images are of water, prairie plants, bird calls, and those natural elements are paired with those of science, math, and literature. 
So photography for me has always been an act of translation rather than capture. I create moods and essences and try to let the birds and the waters, for example, to tell their own stories. Many of the projects that I've shown have a sound installation component, which could be something we could eventually look into and make accessible by QR code down the line if we are interested in that. Thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. And thank you, William. Um, community engagement and question and answer session. Um, now that we have heard from both of the artists, um, we will now open the forum uh, for discussion and, in, and, a, and an exchange of, of ideas. Um, we are asking the community members who have joined the meeting um, to consider highlights of the history of your community or special features of your community, or even if you have suggestions um, of themes that could be um, uh, inspiration for the artists um, for their artwork. Sorry about that. You were hearing my voice and not seeing my face. Anyway, so um, so we'll we'll open this up, and um, I believe Brian will help us with uh, moderating your questions that go into the chat box. And um, both of the artists are here and prepared to um, engage in a dialogue with the community members. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jamie. I work with the outreach team. So if you do have a question, there is a section at the bottom of your Zoom screen where it says raise hand. Feel free to please raise your hand if you do have any questions and we will call on you to ask your question. Geraldine has a question or has their hand raised at least. Geraldine, mute, okay. Um, I have a question for Bill. By the way, I own Spook, your painting from about 20 years ago. And I'm wondering if your color selection will be largely determined by the fact that we're right next to the lake or um, do you have colors in mind or where would you get your uh, inspiration for them? Oh, thank you, Geraldine. I, I don't really have uh, particular colors in mind at the moment. However, I think my work uh, tends to celebrate the sense of liveliness and a kind of optimistic uh, outlook. And so I would tend to prefer more uh, highly saturated or, or richer colors. Um, although, you know, at this time, I, I really am not going to uh, predict exactly what, what they might be. Of course, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, uh, Chicago is sometimes regarded as a gray city, meaning one person once described it as the color of a burnt out light bulb. And uh, this kind of cloudiness or melancholy is something that is certainly true too in the, uh, in the history of Chicago art. When I think back of, to the art of the uh, social realist period or the uh, era after World War II, that time prior to the emergence of the uh, so-called Chicago imagists. Uh, I think I think my own uh, influence and sense of association with the city uh, tends to go more for a kind of idealizing color, uh, something that celebrates the energy and and changeability of the city and its people. And so it's possible that my work will, will continue, uh, my new work would continue with that. I hope that helps. It's, it's a kind of an evasive answer, uh, but I'm open to whatever thoughts you might have on it. 
Did she hear me? Are there any other questions? We, yes, we do. I do have a question in the chat from Julie Carpenter. With the proposed under edge pedestrian walkway under the new red line, I'd like to hear how artists imagine their work might influence the planning development and the selection of artwork for this major initiative. Uh, I do believe that these artists are going to be focused solely on the station art. Um, but I can let Tammy, if you can answer yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Hi, this is Tammy Chase from the outreach team. Um, the community activation, future community activation underneath our right of way, our, our tracks, um, will be separate from the station art uh, that we're here to talk about tonight. But these artists that you're hearing from will create artwork specifically for the station house. So I hope that makes sense. There was a question that was asked during registration, and I think you all sort of, or Alice and Bill, you, you did touch on it. Um, how does your art reflect Chicago and the local neighborhood? Um, if you'd like to speak to what you plan to do or how you feel that it connects to that neighborhood. Well, I think, uh... <clears throat> For myself, I grew up, as I said, very familiar with Chicago neighborhoods, particularly on the north side, and and uh, I, I was uh, often wandering around. I went to school at uh, the Loyola Academy, and so I traveled from where I lived near Belmont and and Sheridan to the Loyola campus. That's where the academy was in those days. And so I went through Edgewater, and and over the years. Uh, uh, found myself uh, often in that neighborhood, not only for, you know, shopping or whatever, but also to visit friends and to be generally aware of the whole of the whole area. I know that the the Edgewater history is uh, one where it was uh, it began as a as a planned suburb, but it was quickly uh, quickly developed uh, more as an urban setting once the the annexation of uh, the adjacent areas to Chicago was was uh, was uh, was done and so the uh, the kinds of structures and and the uh, mixture of peoples and different kinds of uh, histories and cultures all coming together in a very rapidly changing and populating area that we think of as uh, edgewater in fact all of the North side, uh, uh, eastern north side uh, areas of the city. I think that uh, you know almost in a way seamless. Uh, there are some particular historical uh, structures and uh, traditions in Edgewater that that I uh, am trying to learn more about, and I'm uh, again always open to. Uh, to suggestions. I do want my work to be inspiring uh, for the people who live in that area. I want them to feel as if they are recognized and energized um, by the work as uh, you know, participants in the in the urban experience. Uh, I can continue there. Um, so for my work, I have been thinking a lot. Well, my second home is Montrose Bird Sanctuary. I live up there at any spare moment of the day, especially now during spring migration season, where you can see as many as 60 different kinds of species of birds at this time of year passing through. And I'm that might be low, too. Um, uh, so it's just amazing and remarkable what access we have to 
uh, nature literally right in downtown Chicago. And I go to the beach up by Hollywood, Foster, that whole northern part of uh, Lake Michigan is, is the best birding place in the entire state of Illinois, right here, right in the city. And the fact that we can see a snowy owl on our lakeshore in, in a city as large as Chicago is just magical. I can't tell you how magical it was to see that owl and to see it fly and to see it on our shores. And I think that's kind of what my work is trying to aspire, aspire to is to be celebratory and not only um, you know, we have to talk about the vulnerability of species. We cannot not talk about that. But at the same time, we need to be celebratory to build stewardship. So I think what I generally hope with the work is that it will build interest, curiosity, stewardship, and um, get people excited about learning more about what's right in our own back door in terms of habitat and environment and the importance of um, restoring it and uh, keeping it viable. Colors, you know, I think I went into that a lot in the presentation about just the vibrant, unexpected colors of the different species of birds. I mean, there's nothing more vibrant and beautiful than indigo bunting, that blue, um, and we get those here. So I hope that helps. I do have a couple follow-ups from Julie. Um, the first is yes, I understand uh, in relation to the answer to her first question, but I would like to hear their thoughts on how their work might influence other work. Could, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? How our works uh, influence? Uh, yes, Julie started with, I'd like to hear how the artists imagine their work might influence the planning, development, and the selection of artwork for this major initiative. Uh, and she would like to hear how your work might influence others. Hmm. Hi, this is Elizabeth Karpowitz from the CTA Art Program. If I might interject, um, the um, Under Edge project for the Red Line um, is is not necessarily common knowledge. Um, I think this is Tammy can can confirm this. I think this is something that's relatively new. Um, and again, as Tammy said, it does not relate to the interior of the station houses, which is which are the locations that the CTA art program is commissioning the artists to enhance. It's actually the, um, you know, the, the station experience for CTA customers. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. thanks keep, yeah. No, um, no thanks, Lee. I can, I can add to that. Sure, um, thank you. We will have an entire separate process from what we're doing here with, with our station artists to gather community feedback, uh, get some ideas on uh, what the community would like to see in terms of activation under the tracks. That effort will be later this year. And again, it's entirely separate from this. So the artists really are tonight are here to talk about their vision and hear from you um, in, the, in the community what you are interested in seeing as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy and Lee. Uh, just one more follow up from Julie. Uh, the Edgewater Beach Apartments would welcome and invite artists to come and talk to residents and learn about building history. I would love that. I have gone to that building since I was a child. Uh, my grandmother's dear, dear friend lived there. So I have a very fond uh, history and memory of that pink building. Uh, so, and I actually have a friend that is just moving in as well. So I would really welcome that opportunity. I agree, I would too. Uh, I do see a hand up from Stormy Kara. Yes, hi. Uh, so I'm, I recently moved to this kind of neighborhood, um, but I'm really excited to see what uh, art you create for the stations. I wanted to ask if the, I guess, different venue of it being in a train station would influence your decision on what you would make for the art. Would it being in a train station make you take it a different angle as opposed to being in a building? Well, um, 
for one thing I've been thinking about or it, how one thing it's different is it it definitely flattens the work. I can't do multiple layers coming out into space, which I tend to do, which you might have noticed in some of the work. I tend to kind of create depth. So uh, I will try to create depth in other ways. That's partly why I showed that layered slide. So that would be different, but I have always done quite a bit of two-dimensional work. So I'm not concerned about that, but I do love the light play from one pattern leading off to another pattern. Um, there is, I think a portion that is outside that um, actually the bird calls could be a perfect uh, multi-tasking solution in that it, if it is glass, if it is on the facade of the entrance, there's there could be a risk of bird collision there. So that pattern and artwork could function as both bird collision prevention there and as, as my work. Um, the indoor spaces uh, wouldn't need to uh, have that kind of, you could use a ceramic frit on the outside and that's kind of what you use in order to prevent bird collision. So yeah, otherwise I think that um, it would be quite similar to other uh, site-specific opportunities that I've had, thanks. Well, I think one of the uh, uh, ideas I have to keep in mind is that my work will be in a way, an interruption. Uh, people will be coming and going. They're going to be engaged in their own daily activities. And I'm going to be uh, presenting something that uh, tries to capture their attention as they are uh, moving along, as it were. And at the same time, I want to leave them uh, with a visual uh, hint or prod or memory uh, that they may consider as they go about their daily activities. Uh, I want the work to, in a, in a friendly way, uh, give them a pat on the back as they get on the train and, and welcome them home uh, when they come back. And so in that sense, uh, I do want my work to symbolize the, uh, the kind of uh, ambitions and aspirations of uh, the people who see it. Okay, hey, any more questions from anyone? Not seeing any hands up. Or comments, if anyone has any comments or questions as well, comments. I see a hand up by Maureen. Go ahead, Maureen. Maureen, you're muted. You can also type your question in the chat box too and we'll receive it that way or comment. Maureen, you should have a prompt on your screen asking you to unmute. I got the chat. <laughs> she, she's very excited to see the art both artists will be making. I might add one thing that people don't often think about or realize is that on any given night 
in migration season, there are millions of birds passing overhead. And I think that's a beautiful, mysterious aspect of our beautiful city that might come out in the work too, just to underline the, the numbers and diversity and of these individuals that have this freedom to travel through our space and build stewards, you know, build awareness, build stewards and create awe. That's kind of the goal. I have another question from, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I have another question from Catherine. I would like to hear how the artists generally find inspiration for public works. Are you primarily inspired by the site location, the people, the vibe, the nature? What are you reflecting back to the viewer? Well, I think the uh, the site certainly has a, a major importance in in the conceptual organization and creation of an artwork. And uh, I always try to, you know, keep that in mind. For example, when I spoke about the the large mural I did, and uh, I uh, divided the composition into a, a number of component parts so that each part had a sensibility of its own at the same time uh, could stand for other parts that uh, that weren't so easily seen all at once. Uh, so the the site specific nature of an artwork I think is crucial. Uh, secondly, uh, the the I tried to talk about my interest in how people relate to our work on the go, uh, whether they're, they've come purposely to stand and contemplate it, or whether they are passing through or having it as part of their peripheral vision and hopefully as something that calls for their stronger attention or longer attention and has a residue as it were in memory that, that stays with them and perhaps even influences and amplifies uh, the way in which they uh, experience the rest of their day. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I do want my work to relate to how I can imagine and understand, you know, both the people in an area and uh, the, the overall general environment itself. I don't know if that directly answers the question, but that's how I think of it right now. Yeah, I think all of the above can come into play. We're really in just the very first stage of conceptualizing this. So um, I think any of those aspects that you mentioned can come into play. And the more we um, delve into the site, the more we can bring those disparate elements together. When in the proposals that I have I showed during the talk, for example, I love bringing in interdisciplinary aspects. So the bringing together of the natural world with the mathematics, with the statistics, with the data science, or doing something for a library, be sure, you know, being sure that it was talking about uh, what a library offers and where the library is situation situated, and thus that duality of the uh, kind of nature culture. Uh, um, divide or bringing together of the two. So yeah, so I think interdisciplinary, all these different elements can hopefully come together in the work. Great. I do have another question from our registration. We are so excited for the new station. Will the historic district of Bryn Mawr Avenue be reflected in the art? Well, my work is abstract, and so the reflection on the uh, to the historic district, I think, will be there in a kind of symbolic and elusive way. But uh, I, at the moment, I'm not uh, thinking of making direct uh, representations of facades or streetscape. Um, although I'm keenly aware that there's a very uh, uh, long and uh, vibrant. Uh, uh, social history to that area and to the the streets adjacent to the uh, to the station.
I too am an abstract artist. Most of the work is um, quite abstract uh, and often often landscape based. So and the natural world based. So that's kind of what will come into play with the work that I proposed for this. So yeah, but I think through abstraction, a lot of different ideas can come into play. And I think that's the beauty of abstraction. It's a good way for the personal to be related to the, well, to the cultural. And uh, uh, because we all have our, our associations uh, to anything we see, and a lot of the time that it may not be the same kinds of interpretation that other people have or the, whatever the cultural habit might be for interpretation. Uh, but we have to bear in mind that uh, the affect, how we feel about our private associations, especially when they are linked to something larger than ourselves, uh, can be very important to us in terms of our, well, our sense of identity. And so uh, this is the kind of thing that I'm deeply involved with or interested in as an artist. I certainly agree with the uh, uh, with Alice's notion of the stewardship of nature. I think Chicago as a again as a city on the prairie facing a lake uh, and have having this big sky as it were overhead. It's one of the few, really big cities, tall cities in the world where you can still get a big patch of the sky in almost in almost any upward look. Uh, and of course, many whoever's had the experience of flying into Chicago uh, at night uh, is is stunned by the uh, uh, by the enormity and vibrancy uh, of this city. But Nature overrides it all. We you can't really live a day in Chicago without being conscious of and being, well, reverent toward uh, uh, the role of, of nature and, and our responsibility to it. I think this is crucial. And I think Chicago, for all of its ups and downs and successes and failures as a city over time has uh, improved in that regard. Uh, it's certainly better than it was when I was a kid back in the 1940s. And deep in the last century, uh, we are better stewards bit by bit. And I hope this continues. And certainly I want my art to to advocate for that in, in whatever way it can. And then there's the emotional element that you hope to bring in by working with them. Um, uh, imagery and abstraction in the natural world. You, I want to try to convey just the emotions and what it feels like to be immersed in the natural world. Um, that's always a part of what I'm interested in trying to convey. Because if you don't know what's out there too, you don't know what needs to be protected. Uh, I think that's hard to build stewards when people don't know the diversity and all that we already have. Um, so yeah, I don't like the work to be didactic. I want it to be celebratory and, and uplifting and um, hopefully create an emotional response of joy as well. I do just have a comment from Julie. It would be wonderful to have the sound with Alice's installation. Thank you, Julie. I appreciate that. It'll be part of our discussions to see whether we can work that out or not. It might be simply a, having a QR code to link to recordings and go from there. Because with the battle of the sounds of a subway station, um, it probably is hard to hear a real sound installation uh, or too in depth, um, but it, it's something to talk about. Thank you, I appreciate that. Any more questions or comments? I don't have any more in the chat box, uh, anybody uh, or raising their hand. We have just a few more minutes.
All righty, if we're getting nothing else, I think we'll go ahead and conclude. If we could show the last slide, please, with contact information. Thank you. Uh, so thank you all again for joining us this evening. Um, so on the screen in front of you, we have listed all the ways for you to reach out and stay informed on the project. As always, if you have any additional questions or comments regarding the public art or construction, please reach out via email at rpm at transitchicago.com. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you for attending. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.